my friends, welcome to our Wednesday Bible study. And today, we're starting a new uh, lesson, uh, the book of Acts. Uh, one of the things about studying one of the books is that you go really verse by verse, look at things. And so because of that, uh, this could turn into a rather lengthy class. It may be next year before we get to the end of it. You know, So you, you go just as far as you can go with each class. We'll go about 45 minutes like we have been with the others, and we'll just see where we're going. This will also be more of a class, too, than really a presentation. So I covet your questions, or if you got comments or you want to say something, go ahead and say it. I would just encourage you to say it loud so that the ones that are watching online, can, can uh, you can hear by getting picked up by the microphones. However, I, I will repeat it to the best of my ability so that it can get put right out there for people to hear. Uh, we're getting ready to study a, a, a pretty interesting book, the book of Acts. You're going to find that there is so much uh, packed in this book uh, and that it gives us such a, a great insight to a brand new movement. This is the baby church, the church at its inception. And so we get to see it from the start. And uh, it's really pretty amazing. We'll, you'll see just how dependent the uh, people were on the Holy Spirit. In fact, we'll talk a little bit about that. So our first lesson will be basically an introduction, and we'll see how far we get into chapter 1. Our verse for the study, the whole study, will be Acts 2.33. Therefore, being exalted to the right hand of God and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he has poured out this which you now see and hear. Let's pray. Father, again, we thank you for this day. What a blessing it is to be in your house, to, to follow after your precepts, your concepts, uh, your will, your, your perfect will. So we pray, Father, Lord, help our will to diminish so that your will can be in our lives. And we pray, Father, right now that you would just help us through this process completely. So again, I just give you all thanks, all praise, all glory, in the wonderful name of Jesus. Amen and amen. So in the book of Acts, we're going to see a worldview that is God-centered, revolving around the New Testament fulfillment of God's Old Testament promises. It will also be Jesus-focused. Because of all God's promises are fulfilled and through the crucified, resurrected, and exalted Son of God. We're also going to find that it's spirit-empowered. Because God's promise in and through Jesus is to overwhelm us with His presence, sanctifying us for Himself, and, and, and enabling us for His work. And this is so important, especially for the church today. It's not so much of what I'm receiving it's what God is doing within me to prepare me to go forth into a world and do His work, to present His gospel, to be salt and light, to be witnesses in the world. Uh, the book of Acts is all about going out and seeing the lost one. And we as people, what is our responsibility in that? The book of Acts as a whole shows this theological and spiritual worldview in action. And throughout Christian history, it has served as the narrative of the church's spiritual renewal and reform. In the late 19th century and early 20th century, small bands of Christians, often at the margins of political society, returns to its pages and earnestly asks God for a modern Pentecost like the biblical Pentecost, and God answered their prayers. Originally, this book had no title. It was really the second volume of Luke's writing to Theophilus, the first book being the Gospel of Luke. Acts 1.1 says, The formal trestus I have made, O Theophilus, concerning all that Jesus began both to do and to teach. Over time, the book took on the name of the book, the, act, the Acts of the Apostles. The problem with that is, is that there's not many Acts of the Apostles in the whole book. Okay? Uh, all of the Apostles that are mentioned, most of the Apostles that are mentioned, the, the Majority of the apostles, the apostles that are mentioned, are mentioned really in only one, only one chapter. Anybody want to take a guess? Which one? Chapter one. And after that, it's really two people: Paul and Peter. Okay. 
or they're really the only two that are talked about. So it's really not about the Acts of the Apostles. Now, we'll take that as the name of the book. But what would be a better name for the book of Acts, do you think? How about the Acts of the Holy Spirit? That would really be probably a better name for the book. Again, titles are not inspired. And titles are those things that men give to the, to the book. The words themselves are inspired, inerrant, and infallible. We believe they're from God. But a title is not necessarily inspired. So perhaps a better title would be the Acts of the Holy Spirit. So the book of Acts is giving us the history of the birth of the Christian church and its growth over a 20-year period. And I think sometimes that's hard for people to wrap their minds around, too. We'll read chapter 1 all the way through, and to us it takes a day, you know, maybe less. And so it's hard for us to see the division or the, the time period. But this is a 20, from chapter 1 all the way through, uh, it's a 20-year period. And it's broken down kind of like this. If you want to take this note, you, it's kind of broken down like this. The first seven chapters center on the events in Jerusalem, describing the initial growth and the testing of the church. Chapters 8 through 12 reveal how the Spirit broke down barriers in Judea and Samaria. And finally, 13 through 28 show how the gospel began to move towards the ends of the earth. Luke has been called a first-class theologian and historian. But we must remember that the book of Acts is more than just a history book. Th this is one of the things that we face in today, especially in theology or through scholars. There are those, some even in our own denomination, that believe that the book of Acts is nothing more than a book of history. And since it's just a book of history, you can't take doctrine from it. That's a problem, <laughs> you know. Because it, we, we draw a lot of doctrine out of the book of Acts. So although Acts is a history book, at the same time, it's also a book that uh, the Luke used is to show history and how it developed into doctrine. So it's both history and doctrine, at least in my humble opinion. There are those that say that we must go to the epistles for doctrine alone. I disagree. I think they overlook the fact that the Bible does not give us just history to satisfy our historical curiosity, but rather the writers use history to teach truth. So Luke's use of the Old Testament shows that he was a biblical theologian who knew the scriptures well and who believed in their inspiration and their authority. They influenced his language, giving the book really uh, a somatic le leaning or coloring. Okay. In other words, even though Luke was a Gentile, how many of you know that Luke was a Gentile? He had a good grasp of the Jewish law, the Jewish teachings, and how, how the Jewish uh, customs and religion operated. So all scholars give the authority of the book to Luke, the physician, and the only Gentile to author anything in the Bible. Most likely written sometime between 60 to 62 A.D. So our first thought, or the first thing we're going to try to do is we're going to look at Luke as a the theologian. So if you're writing down, taking notes, the first point would basically be Luke as a theologian. You can't study the book of Acts without knowing who Luke was because he's the one that really wrote it. And he also wrote the book of Luke, uh, which really, this is just a continuation of this, the second volume of Luke. Acts is clearly a church book giving us important theological teachings concerning the nature, the growth, the life, and the purpose of the church. For those that claim that Acts is only history, deny that it can provide us with doctrine. Consequently, we must go to the epistles for that. We overlook the fact that the Bible does not just give us history to satisfy our historical curiosity, but rather to teach history or to teach truth. So the, Luke's use of the Old Testament really shows his influence. It's important to recognize, therefore, that Luke uses the part, uh, past to the present, to show us divine truth. He sees God directing the events of history, and he often speaks of the will of God. God and Jesus act in history, and the Holy Spirit gives direction. Howard Marshall had this to say about the book of Acts. He said, throughout Acts, the church remains subject to the guidance of the Spirit, and its work is done through the power of the name of Jesus. It does not possess these gifts. It is a church under the word and subjection to the Lord. So Luke really draws attention also to the way the Holy Spirit promoted the unity of the body. 
Notice how often he mentions in one accord. Luke said this often, in one accord. More than once the church were in danger of being split, but the Spirit brought them back together again. Can you imagine this kind of a ragtag group of people that are the brand new baby church? Not, hardly none of them have any real serious education. They're mostly just uh, fishermen or, or tax collectors or those that, that people would look down on. And yet they came with many different aspects, maybe probably many different personalities, uh, different agendas maybe. And we see that God the Holy Spirit brought them together and put them together in one accord. And that one accord is the power of the Holy Spirit to help them be what God had called them to be for that day and for that time. It's powerful to see. We must understand that God set this together to break down all of the things that disrupt, divide, and build barriers and the Holy Spirit broke down those barriers as the church prayed, as the church worked together, as the church evangelized, as they suffered together. <laughs> is it, there's something about suffering that helps us stay bound, bound together, isn't there? If we're suffering through something, if we're, if we're going through a struggle together, there's something that holds us together. Uh, I was sharing with Han that there's a, the, one of the fellows in church was telling me some of his ailments that he has, some of the issues that he has. I have the same thing. And I told him, I said, you know, I have the exact same thing. And a smile broke out on his face. Why did a smile break out on his face? Because there's comfort. There's comfort in knowing somebody else is struggling through the same issues that you're struggling through. I'm not in it by myself. Uh, many years ago, many, many years ago, Han and I came back from Germany. And you've heard some of our testimony that our girls were just not in a, in a good place. And we were really struggling. But listen, we were saved. Uh, we were church people. Man, if the church doors were open, Han and I were there. And nobody had to tell us to be there. Nobody knew us, really. We were brand new to the area. We could have stayed at our home, and no one would have known the difference. But we knew that we were saved and delivered by the hand of God, and church was important, and we needed to be there. So we went. But we were not all together well. Does that make sense? We just weren't all together well in that prospect because we were having struggles at home. Not with each other, but with our girls. And I remember going to a Wednesday night class that really was going to be a prayer meeting more than anything else. And so they started on one end. I know God put it together just for me. But they started at one end, and they went around the room asking for prayer requests, and practically every prayer request was about my kid who was out of whack, okay? Or somebody giving a testimony of, mine was out of whack, but God brought them back, you know? It went around, and when it got to me, guess what? I felt better. <laughs> I felt, I didn't necessarily feel good, but I felt better because I wasn't in this by myself. Others had gone through the exact same thing that I had gone through. You see this in the book of Acts as the, as the church is bound together with cords that cannot be broken because of the suffering that they had to go through. Nature tends to disperse, scatter, and break down. It takes a higher energy to unite and more wisdom and power to build up than to tear down. That's the reason why that one of the important themes of the book of Acts is church building. Who's the church? We are the church. So we are built up under the power of the Holy Spirit. The acts of the risen Lord are carried forward by the believers as a community of charismatic prophets and by the ministry of six charismatic prophets, Stephen, Philip, Barnabas, Abagus, Peter, and Paul. Now, although Acts gives teachings and show us much of the work of the Holy Spirit, it focuses his attention primarily on Jesus. He is the Prince of Life. He is the one who has come, who is present through the Spirit, and who will come again. His resurrected life and power flow through the book. One more thing that we should keep in mind, unlike many of the other books of the New Testament, the book of Acts has no formal conclusion. There's no formal conclusion. It just simply breaks off or stops. Some suppose that this came about because Luke was martyred shortly after the Apostle Paul. However, several ancient traditions claim that he no longer lived. It seems, rather, that the abrupt ending is intentional. The book had to come to an end, just as the first generation had to come to an end. But the acts of the risen Lord through the Holy Spirit did not end then. They continued on into the second and third centuries with the same spiritual gifts and manifestations. Father, they continue today, whether God's people gather in one accord, with earnest desire to search his word, 
seek his gifts, and do his work. Who believes that the Holy Spirit still operates today? I know that I do. I believe the Holy Spirit is still in operation. He's still active in the church today. In fact, I can't really wrap my mind around, nor can I really truly understand those who say that all the gifts of the Holy Spirit have ceased because the, the scriptures uh, might say that uh, in Corinthians, it says in, in, in uh, chapter 13, I believe it is, that uh, the gift of prophecy, the gift of tongues will cease. But what uh, Paul is talking about there is when we, when we all get to heaven, when we get to heaven, that's when it ceases. While we're here on the earth, guess what? We still need the gifts of the Holy Spirit operating in our lives. Okay. So the content of Luke's gospel and the content of the book of Acts complement each other perfectly. Luke's gospel gives the good news of the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Acts shows the outpouring of the gospel in the first century or the first generation of the church. This work of the Holy Spirit was never intended to come to a conclusion in this age. That's Luke's gospel dealt with what Jesus began to do and teach, showing us three things. So if you're taking notes again, I'll give you these three things that Luke's gospel shows us about what Jesus began to do and to teach. So the first one was, was that the church had its beginning in, really in the gospel of Luke. The church really began in the gospel of Luke. And it ends with a convinced group of believers. Jesus opened their minds so that they could understand the scripture. We find that in Luke 24, 45. They were no longer an easily scattered group of disciples, but a commissioned body, united, worshiping, wanting to be clothed with power from on high. You find that in Luke 24, 49. They were already the church, as Hebrew 9, 15 through 17 makes clear. Christ's death and the shedding of his blood put the new covenant into effect. Thus, the believers who were daily in the temple, especially at the hours of prayer, praising God, were already a new covenant body. They were already the church that carries on the life of Christ. So the gospel, or really the church, had its beginning in the gospel of Luke. And Luke's gospel ends with a convinced group of believers. The second thing is that the work of Jesus did not end when he ascended. As has already been noted, the book of Acts shows that Jesus continued to do and to teach by the Holy Spirit through the church. Jesus is at the center of the narrative, all of it. The Christianity of Acts is characterized by mission, by the effectiveness and the expansion of the Word of God. Its direction and success is dependent on and enabled by the Holy Spirit. And third, Luke carefully investigated everything. This is a good writer. Luke is a, is a wonderful theologian. He's a great teacher. He was concerned about historical accuracy unlike other religions. And Christianity is a historical religion, not based primarily on an ideal or philosophy. What Jesus did, how he lived and died for us, how he rose again and ascended to God the Father's right hand are all essential. You have to look at it like this. There is no doubt. How many believe, I know you do, but how many of you know that Jesus is a historical figure? If you look even outside the Bible, Jesus is a historical figure. There are many other books and documents on the planet that show that Jesus was real. In fact, you could go to a lot of the other religions and they will even say Jesus was a real historical figure. Islam is probably the most prominent one that sees Jesus as a historical figure. They just refuse to accept him as the Son of God or as God himself. It's a fascinating study. For me, it can be a little boring trying to, trying to study Islam. Why do you think Islam might be a little boring for me to study? I'm not interested in it too much, to be honest with you. You know, it's just another, it's another part that doesn't work for me. Yes, sir. What about, what about guys saying that they believe in the virgin birth, but they don't believe that Jesus is God? Yeah, it's really interesting. Some of the things that they believe in, and then, but then again, they don't believe that Jesus is the Son of God. It's, it's interesting. And I didn't mean, I don't mean to start out on, on Islam or any other world religions necessarily, but it is important to understand where does Christianity fit in this. And we have to understand that uh, this is more, Christianity is more than just a religion of ethics or ideals. This is the very power in the Word of God. This is God Himself, Jesus Christ Himself, who teaches and shows us and brings to us that that we need to be the people that He's called us to be. 
Verse 1, the former the, uh, theist, I have I made, O Theophilus, concerning all that Jesus began to both do and teach. So there's no doubt Jesus was teaching and showing and preparing. We see that at the very end of the book of Luke, and we see that at the beginning of the book of Acts. Jesus is still teaching and showing. Let's look at verse 2. Until the day when he was taken up, after he had given commandments through the Holy Spirit to the apostles whom he had chosen. Now, if, we're, if we quickly run over that scripture, if we quickly run over it, we miss maybe the most important part. What, what is the most important part? Look at it again. Let me read it again. Until the day that he was taken up, after he had given commandments through the Holy Spirit to the apostles whom he had chosen. We find here that not only is Jesus still teaching, but he's giving commandments right up to the time that he ascends into heaven. Jesus is still helping and encouraging and showing his people what it is they need in their lives. Instruction through the Holy Spirit to those that were there for him. And I know that it says uh, to the apostles, but there are many that believe that there were so many more than just the twelve. There were probably hundreds that were there that day. Listening to the teachings of Jesus, listening to the commands that he was given. The Holy Spirit is working already. The Holy Spirit is giving already. The Holy Spirit is preparing hearts already, giving clear instruction to the apostles and impressing them on, onto their memories. They were the chosen uh, uh, recipients and custodians of the body of teaching that we have today that we find in the New Testament. And this is not about Jesus giving secret teachings. How many of you know there, there's no such thing really as secret teachings? Secret teachings are not gospel. Secret teachings are not of God. There are mysteries. Somebody shout amen. There definitely are mysteries. There are definitely things that I don't comprehend fully. All right? But God will never keep anything from us that is not important for us to know. How many of you believe he reveals things to us? In fact, let's take a moment. We'll just take a moment and do it. Turn in your Bibles, if you will. And I don't have it. I'll have to turn to my Bible as well. But turn to Deuteronomy 29, 29. And let's just read it together. Deuteronomy 29 and 29. And then mark it in your Bibles because this is good. Here's what it says. It says, the secret things belong to the Lord our God. If there are secret things, who do they belong to? They belong to God. But those things which are revealed, somebody shout amen. Are things revealed? Have things been revealed? But those things which are revealed belong to us and to our children forever so that we may what? Keep all the words of this law. In other words, to follow the law of God. So God is going to reveal to us his perfect law, his perfect will. He'll give that to us to have and he'll put it in our hearts, okay, and bring that to our memories. Uh, I've had many times in my life where I've had in my spirit or in my mind, I had nothing I could say. I had no recall. But then God, the Holy Spirit, would begin to speak into my spirit and actually speak through me. And I find myself even amazed at the end of a conversation saying, wow, did I have that? Did I really have that to say? And it's God, the Holy Spirit working through us. So God is working. The Holy Spirit, even before Jesus ascended, is still giving commands to the church today. Verse 3. To whom he presented himself alive after his passion by many infallible proofs, appearing to them for 40 days, speaking concerning the kingdom of God. Now, we've had him teaching. We now have him giving commandments. Now what is he doing? He's giving instruction on the kingdom of God. Apparently, the apostles included those to whom Jesus showed himself in a definite way and at definite times for 40 days after his suffering, that is, after the Passion Week and crucifixion. To them, he gave many convincing proofs, signs that he was true and real. And he also spoke to them about God's kingdom, that is, his rule and his plan. Now, listen to me very carefully. There are really two thoughts when it comes to God's kingdom. Most people would, would put God's kingdom in the millennial reign. And it's accurate. That's part of God's kingdom rule. But there is a part of God's kingdom that rules even today. All right? 
And that kingdom is rules in our heart as Jesus Christ takes up residence and we give ourselves to him completely. Who rules in your life if you're a Christ follower? Jesus. And he says to us and gives to us wonderful teachings on the kingdom of God. And if we would just follow after that. Jesus is giving to his, to his disciples here the, the, the many things concerning the kingdom of God. Let's look at verses 4 through 5. Being assembled with them, he commanded them, Do not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father, of which you have heard from me. For John baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So Luke's gospel condenses the 40 days after the resurrection and jumps to the final exhortation for the 120 to wait in Jerusalem until they were clothed with power from on high. In Acts 1, 4, Luke again goes to the time immediately preceding the ascension. Jesus was eating with them. At that time, he repeated the command, emphasizing that they were not to leave Jerusalem. This is most important. They were not to leave Jerusalem. The day of Pentecost would have little effect if only two or three of them remained in Jerusalem. Father, Jesus began his ministry in the power of the Holy Spirit. So must they. For we Pentecostal believers, this is so very important. Listen, we are told to go forth and be, to be the light, salt and light to the world. We absolutely are. And God has given us the ability to do that. and We are called to do that. But there's a part of us too that needs to wait on power from on high. Now, now listen to me very carefully. We need the power of God to be the people of God that He wants us to be. We are already at salvation and dwelled by the power of the Holy Spirit. But we also need the empowerment ministry of the Holy Spirit so that we can go and be that that God has called us to be in the world around us. The day of Pentecost needed all of them to be there so that they could be full of the Holy Spirit. There is no conflict here with the command given on the resurrection day to go away into G uh, Galilee. By comparing the Gospels, we can see that Jesus initially commanded the, wi the women to tell the di disciples to go to Galilee because Peter and John did not really believe. You have to kind of go back into the Gospels a little bit here at the beginning of Acts to see some of what's going on because there was a little dispersing after the, uh, after the uh, crucifixion of Jesus. There was some dispersing of the disciples. They went in different directions. There is no conflict here, okay? Uh, they did go into different parts of the, the land, different places of the land, and then they were called back together uh, at a certain period of time. So we really, we just have to grab hold of the ideal uh, that Jesus appeared at the end of the, after his resurrection from the dead, and he began to speak and teach into the lives of the people. I know you all remember Thomas, who was not present at the very first uh, uh, sign of Christ when he came. We know that story very well because we call him what? Doubting, Doubting Thomas, okay, <laughs> because... When they met, they began to, they started with Pete. When Thomas came, they started telling him what happened. He goes, Dah. I'm not believing that for one minute. I can see Thomas doing this. Until Jesus shows up and I can touch his side. So I can put my hand in his hand, will I believe? And that's when what? That's when Jesus showed up. Here you go, Thomas. Put your put your hands in hand. And he fell on his face and immediately said, My God, my Lord. It's a beautiful time. But we have to understand that these guys are going through emotions and going through times that are hard maybe for us to understand. We have the complete Bible before us. We have all of that before us. These guys were kind of scattered. They were emotional. They didn't really didn't have any idea what they were going to do. Imagine if someone told you, you are going to go forth and not only win your, your family and not only witness to your neighborhood, but you'll witness to SeaTac in King County and Washington State, and all of America. And then when you're done there, you'll witness to the world. I would imagine most of us would be going, yeah, right. <laughs> but Jesus said that to them, didn't he? But he said, you gotta, you got to wait. you got to wait to get the power from on high. So, the gift of the Holy Spirit is the Father's promise also relates to the Old Testament promises. The ideal of promise is one of the bonds that unite the Old and New Testament. The promise to Abraham was not only that he and the nation of Israel would be blessed, but so all peoples on the earth would be blessed through him, Abraham. 
and through his offspring. When Abraham believed, trusted God's promise, his faith was put down on the credit side of his account for righteousness. The story of God's dealing with his people is a step-by-step revelation. First, he promised defeat of Satan through the seed of the woman. Then he gave his promise of blessing for the offspring of Abraham, of Isaac, of Jacob, of Judah, and of David. And finally, Jesus appeared as David's greatest son, God's David, or beloved. And along with the promises that led to the coming of Jesus, we find promises of the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. We have been promised the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. And that outpouring of the Holy Spirit still goes forth today. Who agrees? Still goes forth today. Paul also referred to what must have been these promises. Jesus had already promised this mighty outpouring of the Spirit to his followers. We find that in John chapter 7, verses 38 through 39, and especially chapters 14 through 16. You've read through those chapters, I'm sure, John 14 through 16. The promise of the Holy Spirit. So had John the Baptist, whose baptism was limited to baptizing in water, now Jesus, John promised, would baptize them in the Holy Spirit. Jesus further promised that it would occur soon. This promise that Jesus would baptize in the Spirit indicates that the Pentecostal narrative is essential for the ongoing ministry of the Spirit. From the day of Pentecost onward, they were an eschatological community of Spirit-baptized, Spirit-empowered, and Spirit-filled prophets. In other words, they were a group of people that were saved by the power of God. They were baptized in the Holy Spirit. They were empowered, and they were Spirit-filled, and they had the prophetic voice of God. It was the only way this group of people were going to go forth and win the world. And guess what? God's word is still going forth even today, isn't it? Through the power of the Holy Spirit. Note that Jesus made clear distinction between baptism in water and baptism in the Holy Spirit. The fact that in the church history, theologians eventually tied baptism in the Spirit to water baptism, that was just purely devastating to the teaching and not accurate, nor is it accurate even today. Listen to me very clearly. There are two baptisms, water baptism and spirit baptism. There are some that would teach that both are the same and that it's water baptism, but it is not. And it's pretty clear in Scripture. I don't know how some people could even make that distinction. Yet I talked to a young man not too long ago who had uh, converted to Catholicism, believe it or not, and he basically told me there was no baptism in the Holy Spirit. There was just water baptism. I thought how sad it is that we don't understand, okay, the Scriptures of God and how people can be deceived and influenced by the things that go on around us. There is truly two baptisms, one in water, one by the Spirit. And these that are baptized, and, and especially through the, through the baptism of the Holy Spirit, these transfer to converts in Christian homes. And they are meant to give us the empowerment that we need and the life that we need through the Holy Spirit and to draw near to God through that. The Pentecostal revival has brought needed restoration. As Pentecostals and Charismatics, we find that the baptism of the Holy Spirit is still an overwhelming experience that initiates a new level of life in the Spirit. Now, let me just encourage, because someone will send me a note and say, what, what is the difference between Pentecostal and Charismatic? So let me take a moment and just speak into that. I am a classical Pentecostal. That's what I am. I'm not a Charismatic nor do I claim to be. Uh, a classical Pentecostal is one who believes that the baptism in the Holy Spirit is evidenced by speaking in tongues as the Spirit gives the evidence. A charismatic might teach that all nine gifts listed in, the, in, in uh, 1 Corinthians 12, any one of those evidence show the baptism in the Holy Spirit. And that tongues is one of those things that comes almost to everyone Regardless, And I just would say that I don't find that clear in the, in the scriptures. I, what I find in the scriptures is that when a person is baptized in the Holy Spirit, that's evidenced by speaking with other tongues. There may be other gifts given or other gifts that are signaled, but every time they're speaking in tongues. And even when it's not very specifically mentioned, it's implied <coughs> heavily. So just as a difference between a charismatic and a, and a Pentecostal. And again, I am one that considers myself to be a classical Pentecostal. 
we find that the baptism of the Spirit is still an overwhelming experience that initiates a new level of life in the Spirit. We find, too, that this baptism is the gateway to a special understanding of the gifts that Paul gave us in Corinthians. Prophetic-type gifts, including the message of wisdom, the message of knowledge, the prophecy, distinguishing between spirits, different kinds of tongues, and the interpretation of tongues. We need those gifts even today. They have not gone away. We should desire to have them and see them in our lives. Let's look at verses 6 through 7. So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, It is not for you to know the times or the dates which the Father has fixed by his own authority. It had to be difficult for the, for the, the apostles. I, I can only imagine some of the issues they were going through. Jesus told them that they were going to get power. And they immediately thought, here, I'm getting, we're, we're getting ready to have the power to destroy Rome. And Jesus said, no, 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 not power. Power. <laughs> not, not a military might, but a spiritual might. Kingdom. Yes, kingdom. We're going to overthrow the Roman kingdom and we'll have our own. Jesus said, no, 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 not kingdom. Kingdom. Not an earthly power, but a spiritual power. A spiritual kingdom. Not, not a kingdom run by a, a, an earthly or worldly king, but a kingdom, God's kingdom, one that is established by His hand and His might and by His glory and by His power so that we can be people that will go forth and establish His kingdom on the planet. And, and that kingdom really is one that works in such a way to see people completely changed and delivered and set free. It, it just must have been a... a a, a, a real struggle for them. <laughs> so they ask him, say, okay, when, when is it coming, Jesus? When is, when is that time coming? And Jesus, what does he tell them? It's not for you to know. It's for you to do what I tell you to do. In the Acts and the Epistles, we find a great deal more about the Holy Spirit and the church than we do about the kingdom. But the kingdom was an important part of Jesus' teaching. Suffering in James and John's response set on his right hand and on his left in the kingdom. And this shows that the cross carries with it a promise of the kingdom. So in, in Jesus in Luke 12, 32 also assures the disciples that the Father has been pleased to give you the kingdom. The word kingdom in the New Testament deals primarily with, with the king's power and rule. Righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit are evidence that God is ruling in our lives and that we are in his kingdom but that does not exclude the future kingdom. So when the disciples were questioning Jesus about the restoration of the kingdom to Israel, they were thinking of the future rule. They, had, they knew the prophecies. They'd been taught the prophecies. Prophecies in Ezekiel, the promises of, of a restoration of Israel, the prophecy that, again, God would restore Israel to the promised land and the outpouring of God's Spirit. They also knew that God's promise to Abraham included not only his seed and blessing on all nations, but also on the land all through the Old Testament, the hope of God's promise to Israel is connected with the promised land. Ezekiel saw that God would reinstate Israel in the land. First, in unbelief and then in spiritual renewal. He would do this not because they deserved it, but because to reveal his own holy name and character. Since Ezekiel also prophesied God's spirit to be poured out on a restored and renewed Israel, the promise of the spirit called this to their minds. Thus, there was more than mere curiosity that caused the disciples to ask about this part of God's promise. They had been taught this day in and day out as they grew up in teaching and understanding the Jewish way. And Jesus did not rebuke the disciples, nor did he deny that there was still God's plan to restore the kingdom. But here on earth, they would never know the times and the dates of that restoration. And that's, there's a reason for that. If man knows the days and the times, if they understood that, they would be making all kinds of crazy decisions, weren't they? But what was Jesus saying? Follow me. Be prepared. Be ready. Do what I tell you to do. Stop trying to figure things out that you really don't have an authority to know or a reason to know. God sets things by his own authority, not through ours. He is the only one who knows all things and has the wisdom to take all things into account. Therefore, times and dates are his business, not ours. Now listen, we, we have to grab hold of this concept that there are two ways to look at things. There's the linear way 
a linear way says there's a beginning, a middle, and an end. Okay, and most of us, all of us, walk on that plane. We live in that plane. It's too hard for us to understand anything but beginning, middle, and end. God looks at things through a global sphere. Okay, He knows the end before the beginning, the beginning before the end, and everything in between. God has an understanding of all those things. I don't. I, and I, the reason why that I love to give that that way is that sometimes we say, I don't understand God. Why does he operate the way he operates? Why does he allow things the way he allows things? Uh, wh why did Joseph have to spend all those many years in prison? Why? Because God had a plan. God had a plan for salvation. Do you, do you wonder, did, did Joseph ever understand? Probably not. But he still was obedient to God. He still said, yes, Lord. We, we have to do the same thing. But I guarantee you there were days when he woke up in prison going, I don't get it. <laughs> Why am I here? Why am I going through what I'm going through? And I don't think there's anything wrong with questioning that. But at the end of the day, what do we have to do? We have to say, yes, Lord. At the end of the day, yes, Lord, I understand. Do you think it, it would have removed a sense of urgency from the disciples? Yeah, yes. Of course. Uh, the question was, do you think that that would have given them uh, uh, a sense of... Uh, the, remove the sense of urgency. In other words, I, I know if I know the time and the date, I don't have to do anything. Isn't this really the, the argument? I, I had, uh, I had uh, a couple of uncles. Uh, they have both gone to be with the Lord now. But I had a couple of uncles that uh, listened to a preacher one time tell them that Jesus was returning on this date. We've seen those guys, right? We've all seen these guys, heard of these guys. Jesus is returning on this date. They had one of those. Jesus is returning on this date. They sold everything they had. Okay, quit their jobs and went and waited on the side of a mountain for Jesus to come back. No, no kidding. Okay, they were good men. These were good men. These were not bad guys. They were sincere in their belief. They were just sincerely what? Wrong. And not only were they sincerely wrong, they were not really doing it. They were sitting on the side of a hill when they needed to be doing what? Working, doing the things God had told them to do. There were lost people that needed to be ministered to. We... We don't need to know the date and the time. We, we, all know the, we all know the parable of the ten virgins. Okay, We've all heard this, this story many times. The, there were five that had all the oil they needed and they were ready. And there were five that did not. Okay, And when they heard the bridegroom coming, all right, when they, when they heard that the, the groom was coming, the five that didn't have any oil wanted what? They wanted some of what the others had, the other five had. Now listen, this is a clear indication, to me anyway, through Scripture, all right, that there were five that were ready for when Jesus came and five that what? Were not. And they wanted to borrow from the ones that were ready. Did you know you can't borrow salvation? You can't borrow the, the power of the Holy Spirit. You have to ha it has to be a personal relationship. You have to be ready for God. You can't, I can't rely on Han. Han can't rely on me or anybody else. We have to be ready for the coming of Jesus. And that's really the part that we see here when Jesus says, get, get, out, get out of your head and get back into the game. Understand what it is that you need to be doing. Let me, let me just we'll finish right now with verse number 8. I won't get into a whole lot of uh, discussion about it, but we'll at least read it. Verse 8. But you shall receive what? Power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you shall be my witnesses to Jerusalem and to all Judea and to Samaria and to the ends of the earth. What was their business? They were to receive power when the Holy Spirit came upon them. We'll finish that next week. Father, again, I thank you so much for your day. I thank you for this day that we've had an opportunity to study your word and look at it. Help us, Father Lord, as we continue to go through it. Be a blessing to those that are gathered here today. Be a blessing to those that are watching us online. I give you all glory and praise, and I thank you for the touch that you have put on my life. Now take it and use it, Father Lord, for your glory and your glory alone. And I give you all thanks and praise in Jesus' most wonderful name. Amen. God bless you to those that are here. Thank you for being here today. Those that are watching online, love you so much. Appreciate you checking in with us. Until we meet again, God bless.